It's 12.30, so it's time to start the class. Are there any questions that anybody has from what we've already studied or what, any questions about the class, its performance, whatever? I see a no. No. Remember, asking a question of yes and no's, typing in yes or no gives me an indication that you are still here and allows me to keep you as uh, active in the class. If you're not active in the class, then you're not here in the class. So be sure to type in no or yes in the chat bar if I ask a no or yes question. So if there are no questions about anything, uh, this weekend, you have the sensation and perception quiz due. There's no discussion for this particular one. But there is a test, test number three, which is due on Sunday, Sunday night. And if uh, at this point now you have taken two tests and both of those tests have been dropped, they have not been added to your grade because they are so far the lowest two tests. If uh, when you take test number three, all of a sudden you're going to see a test score activate inside of your, your grade because now it will figure out which of the two tests are the lowest of the three and drop them and add the third one. No matter what you get on the third test, if it's not the highest grade, it won't be counted. One of the other two will be counted. So you, if you take this test, when you take this test before Sunday night, you will start to see a massive change in your grade at that point because now the test score is going to start taking effect. Just wanted to make sure that you guys uh, are, are aware of that. Quinn, I see that you signed in. Thank you very much for signing in. So that's this week. That's what we're working on. But we're still finishing up learning, so that's what we'll do today is finish up the learning section. So let me change the share to this one. And this is where we ended last time. We ended talking about the incredible research that uh, Skinner did teaching pigeons to drop bombs on enemy ships in World War II, which really took over psychology. And the reason it took psychology, and you had to be a Skinnerian, you had to be a behaviorist for about 40 years, because when, you, when the government saw this, military is the largest budget in the, in the government, when the military saw this, like, what else can you do besides teaching pigeons to drop bombs on enemy ships? the first smart bomb, even though it's pigeon brain, you know, what, what else can you do? And of course today we have dogs that work with the Department of Fe all kinds of animals that work with the Department of Defense, that work with state governments, state police, with hospitals, with the disabled. There's a huge number of things that we can teach animals to do. And like I said, that was my research, that's what I wanted to do was to work with animals, and so I am an animal psychologist. So that was Skinner. Skinner also created what's called a study box, and later he called, it, it's called a Skinner box, he did not like that, but he called it a study box. I had a number of Skinner boxes that I controlled with a computer in my master's program back in 1983 when there weren't very many computers around and it was really a lot of fun and that's why I got into computers. And that's why I did not get my PhD in, in psychology. Instead, I went on to do some work in computers instead. So he did this so that he could control light and sound in the boxes and he created an environment where he could control the circumstances that followed behaviors. And we call those reinforcement and punishment. And this is 
the story of reinforcement and punishment, operant conditioning or operating on the environment. So before I even start, I'm going to tell you punishment is not a good idea in any form that reinforcers rewards are way more powerful than punishment is. And we'll talk about why as we go along here. So reinforcers are any stimulus that increases behavior that makes it occur more frequently, that makes it stronger, or makes it more likely to occur. Anything that does that is called a reinforcer. You must look at the behavior and see if the behavior is increasing or if the behavior is decreasing. And then you can define whether it is increasing a reward or reinforcer or whether it is decreasing a punisher. Then there are two words that we use that you have used all your life, but we do not use them the same way. And this is confusing for a lot of students. Positive does not mean good, and negative does not mean bad. Positive is giving something to somebody or something, and negative is taking something away. So positive means to present something, such as what we call a positive reinforcer, candy to a child or a hug. And negative means to take something away. So a negative reinforcer is removal of an unpleasant stimulus contingent on the particular behavior. Your child is required to take out the trash every day. They have, that's just their job. They have to take the trash out every day. But they bring home all A's on the report card. Well, for a week, you don't have to take the trash out anymore. You just took away something that they don't like doing in order to increase their possibility to increase their A acquiring, right? so that they will do more to get A's in order not to have to take the trash out anymore. So primary reinforcers are the biological reinforcers, such as water and food and sex. They have an innate basis because of their biological value to an organism. The secondary reinforcers are like money, where we can't eat money, we can't drink money. You know, you, so you, you pay using money to get food and drink. So this secondary reinforcers are stimuli such as money or tokens that acquire their reinforcing power by their learned association with primary reinforcers. We have to find money in order to live to pay the rent, to pay the electricity, to pay the water bill, to pay for gasoline, to pay for the house, to pay for the cars, we have to earn money. So we will do things that will reward us by giving us money. Uh, they're also called conditioned reinforcers. We hark back to the classical conditioning in this part because they have found a way to connect to those things that are biologically necessary and sort of reflex actions. And tokens work well with children. You may not remember, but in elementary school, you probably had gold stars on the board in the front of the room and next to your name. And if you had a lot of gold stars at the end of the week, you probably got to not have to do homework or you could get something extra at lunch, an extra dessert for lunch or more recess time uh, you had some sort of privilege given to you because you had those stars. That's a token. And you traded those tokens in for something that you wanted. And also it works good with mentally challenged adults as well, these tokens. Yeah. When you reinforce somebody, you can do it continuously. Every single time that they do a specific task, you reinforce them. That is rather um, unusual. We don't usually get continuous reinforcement. What we get instead is partial reinforcement, a reinforced schedule in which some but not all correct responses are reinforced. This is also called intermittent reinforcement. You uh, praise a dog and you feed it when it does something right. You praise the dog and feed it when it does something right. You praise the dog and feed it when it does something right. And later you just praise the dog, you don't actually feed the dog anymore, but the praise tends to uh, take the same power as the feeding.
did. So that's partial reinforcement. Uh, most of the time, the dog will do something and you'll ignore it, but every once in a while, you'll reward it, and that's partial reinforcement. Extinction is the same as in classical conditioning. It is the re removal of that particular behavior because the animal is no longer being reinforced. So in operant conditioning, this is a process by which the response that has been learned is weakened by the absence or removal of the reinforcement. And this is very similar to classical conditioning's extinction. So in operant conditioning, uh, the event that follows the behavior you want to change can occur all the time, that's continuously, or some of the time, that's partial or intermittent. And the partial scenario can be based on an interval of time or on ratio of events. So the ratio of events is prov providing rewards after a certain number of responses. After the person has done six good things, you give them a reward. That's a ratio. And interval schedule is when a person does something good, you give them a reward, and then they do something good, and they do something good, and they do something good, and they won't get the reward until time period has passed, some certain time interval has passed. That's why it's called an interval schedule. They can be based on four different principles, so fixed ratio or variable ratio, and a fixed interval or a variable interval. And when you give these four different contingency patterns, you get four different extinction patterns as well. So the ratio, fixed ratio, fixed ratio is rewards appear after a certain set number of responses. And the best example I've ever seen on this is that factory workers will get paid for every 10 boxes of product that are completed in the factory. You don't get paid for the ninth. When the tenth one is finished, you get paid. Then you have to have another 10 before you get paid again. That's a ratio. So a certain number of things have to happen, then you get rewarded. The variable ratio is nearly identical, but you don't know when you're going to get paid. So you're producing boxes, producing boxes on the factory floor, and you get paid uh, every once in a while, but you're not really sure how many boxes that you had to get because the first box may pay you, and then the eighth box may pay you, and then the twelfth box may pay you, and then the tenth box may pay you, but when you add them all together and divide by the number of times you got paid, it turns out to be a ratio of 10. So that's, it could be any ratio, but I just picked the number 10. So this is rewards appear after a certain number of responses, but that number varies from trial to trial. And it turns out that this creates the most powerful behavior that is very difficult to extinguish. And this is the reason why slot machines use variable ratio to pay you for putting your quarter in and pulling the slot machine bar. And when they, they will, they pay you on a variable ratio, so you're never sure when you're going to get paid, and then all of a sudden they stop paying you, but you don't know they stop paying you. If it was continuous reinforcement or if it was a fixed ratio, then you would know exactly that you had stopped getting paid. You don't know in variable ratio if you've stopped getting paid. And so you just keep pushing your quarters in, pushing your quarters in, pushing your quarters in, and that's how they make their money. So it's a very hard to extinguish the behavior that has been rewarded, which is putting the money in and pulling the lever. The intervals are based on time. So a reward that appears after a certain fixed amount of time, regardless of the number of responses that have been made. So if you are responding in any way, shape, or form, and the time frame goes by, then you get rewarded. And weekly or monthly paychecks is a perfect example of that. It does not matter how good you are or how excellent you are or how exceptional you are at your work. You get paid on a weekly or monthly basis. And in many instances, you get paid just as much as the person who does very little, but just enough not to get fired. And so what happens is the entire group ends up being at the base level doing just enough not to get fired. And there's, you learn really fast not to work your best because you're going to get paid anyway. 
And that's why there are bonuses. That's why they put bonuses out there so that if you did a good job, a better job than anybody else, then you get a bonus. Now people will start to fight for their bonuses. And the variable interval is uh, what's basically people who are managers ha are taught specifically how to be managers. And they don't listen very well. And they're told that they need to randomly visit their employees and tell them that they're doing a good job or send them an email and tell them that they're doing a good job. The problem is that in that whole training session, they're also told they have to know their employees. So I had a boss once that used to show up every once in a while. You never knew when he was going to show up and tell everybody in the office, you're doing a great job, good job, keep, keep doing it. And I knew for a fact he had no idea what I did. So he can't possibly know if I'm doing a good job because he doesn't even know what my job is. You have to get to know your employees. Then when you tell them that they're doing a good job, it means something to them. So random visits, unknown time frame between visits is the variable interval schedule. Now I'm going to talk about punishment. And I do not condone punishment. Punishment does not work like we think it does. Certainly, a child who is positively punished uh, changes their behavior right away, and that's why the parents tend to like to use it, because it changes behavior right away, and it takes a long time for reinforcement to work, but punishment works fairly rapidly but it also does some negative things as well. And unless you're doing it consistently and immediately, it really doesn't work very well at all. And we'll talk about that here. So punishers is any stimulus that decreases behavior, makes it occur less frequently, makes it weaker, or makes it less likely to occur. Any stimulus that does that is called a punisher. Positive, again, does not mean good, and negative does not mean bad. Positive means giving something. Negative means taking something away to reduce behavior because what you're looking at is the behavior. If the behavior is being reduced, it's punishment. If the behavior is being increased, it's reward. So positive punishment is the application of an adverse stimulus after a response, after the behavior, to decrease that response or behavior. An example of this is for parents hollering and screaming and slapping and spanking. And for the state, fines and tickets and points on insurance. Negative punishment means to take something away. Negative to reduce the behavior. Negative punishment is the removal of a pleasant, attractive stimulus contingent on a particular behavior to decrease that behavior. So for instance, your child does something just terrible, and you give me your phone. You've lost the privileges of using your phone for a week. And that's negative because you're taking something away, and it's punishment because you're hoping to decrease the behavior they did by doing that particular punishment. And negative punishment is certainly better than positive punishment. Positive punishment has some really negative results other than um, the fact that it it does work and stops the behavior, but negative has less of those negative, less of those bad, I don't say negative, negative, that's bad, I shouldn't say that. Um, negative punishment has less re repercussions. So here is a, two different things, um, positive punishment, negative reinforcement to give you an idea of the two. If you have a loud noise in an environment, rats do not like it. I don't know how they live in New York, but uh, there's, if they, they do not like loud noises. So put them in a cage with a loud noise, and they will push a lever if the lever causes the, the bad noise, the, the horrible noise, to stop. So loud noise is removed if they press the lever. That means they're going to press the lever more, which means that it is reinforcement because the behavior has increased and you've taken something away, the loud noise. So they press the lever, the loud noise goes away, they will continue to press that lever to keep that loud, loud noise away. 
And for positive punishment, there is no noise in the environment. And if they press the lever, noise occurs. So they will not press that lever. Now, we, if you put a, a rat in a Skinner box, they wander around the cage and they press the lever occasionally just because the lever is there. And we can test and see how often they press the lever when there's no consequences whatsoever. So we know what their regular bar pressing is. Let's say two times an hour they press the bar. Well, we can get them to press it less with positive punishment, or we can get them to press it more with negative reinforcement. And remember, what you think is aversive or attractive may not be to the subject. If you spank a child, 1% of all, the, all people, all human beings, 1% are masochists, meaning they like pain. That's what masochism is. They like pain. And so if you're spanking a child who is a masochist, you have rewarded that child. You have not punished that child. So that's one problem with operant style of conditioning. You don't know whether you're giving a reward or a punishment until you see what happens to the behavior. If I'm in some sort of research and they do something and I do a, a particular response which they want me to increase and they give me a banana, I'm going to increase that behavior because I love bananas. So I'm going to continue to do that particular whatever it was behavior that they got me the banana. If you give my wife a banana, she will stop doing that. She won't even kiss me if I've eaten a banana. She hates the smell of bananas. So she, if for her, it's a punishment. For me, it's a reward. The exact same thing is, either, is one thing for one person, one thing for another person. Now we have to remember we're talking about the normal distribution curve. And for normal, the 68% of the people, they agree on very specific types of rewards and punishments. But uh, you have to understand that there is a possibility that what you're doing is not a reward as you thought it was or is not a punishment as you thought it was. So they are defined by their effect on the behavior. The first thing to always look for in a test or a quiz, always look at what behavior is changing and is that behavior increasing or decreasing. If the behavior increases, it's always reward. If it decreases, it's always punishment. Then you have to look at what are they doing? Are they giving something or taking something away? And then you can know it's either giving something positive or taking something away negative. Here's the Hollywood squares of operant conditioning. We have the positive going down. We have negative going down. We have increasing behavior going to the side at the top level and decreasing behavior going to the side on the bottom level. So the first square is positive and reinforcement. Uh, you get a bonus for working hard and that leads to more hard work. The other side of that is negative reinforcement. We're still increasing behavior, but now we're subtracting something and the behavior that we're looking at is eating aspirin. You can increase a person's eating aspirin if the aspirin takes the headache away. If the aspirin didn't take the headache away, then they won't continue to eat the aspirin and increase their aspirin intake. But if it does take the headache away, they will increase their aspirin intake. Then we're decreasing behavior. That means punishment. So positive punishment is giving something. Getting speeding tickets leads to less speeding. And decreasing behavior on the, punt, on the negative side, missing dinner leads to less staying out late. How many of your parents ever did this? They, my mom used to say, you be home by 5.30. We're having dinner at 5.30. If you're home later than 5.30, then you're not going to have dinner. I'm, I'm throwing it out, and you're going upstairs without your dinner. In the hope to decrease my staying out late, so that I would come home on time, right? decrease the staying out late. Have any of your parents ever done that to you? I'm seeing a lot of no's. Well, here's the reason why um, my mom, you did it to me. But then I'd be like, 
oh my gosh, it's 5.30 and I'm not home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss dinner. Well, then I'll stop at McDonald's and I'll have dinner myself. So I really didn't work for her to do that because I could take care of that issue myself by stopping at McDonald's before I got home. You can see that the operant conditioning, you have to be in control of all of the different variables in a person's life in order to be able to use it. Skinner was born in 1904, and he died in 1990, not very long ago. And he was actually trying to be a writer. He wanted to be a writer. He had no interest in any kind of science. He wanted to be a writer because he felt like that was the least amount of work he ever had to do, was just write, write a book, and then he'd be famous. And he convinced his parents that after he got his degree, it, he would stay home, his parents would take care of him for one year, and he would write his book and become famous and make his own money. And within a year and a half, they kicked him out because he hadn't written a single page. <laughs> and so he went back to school, and he, went, he said, ah, okay, I'm going to be a scientist. What kind of science is available? And all the science classes were filled except for one, the psychology class, and so he was put in the psychology class, and that's how he got to be a psychologist. No real interest in psychology until then. But then he became a famous psychologist, and he wrote a book about a civilization that was using his ideas of operant conditioning. I think it was called Walden II, and he became a famous writer then, science fiction writer, because of that. So it just took him a long time to finally become a writer. So operant conditioning, shaping and maintaining behavior by assuming that consequences, by assuring that specific consequences follow. Remember that in this context, positive does not mean good and negative does not mean bad. That's very important and very hard for certain students to understand. Reinforcement makes something always happen more often. Punishment always makes something happen less often. So look at the behavior and decide, is the behavior increasing or decreasing? At that point, you can say whether you've got reinforcement or punishment. And then look at what they're doing to get that behavior to change. Is it positive or negative? Positive means you're presenting something like candy. And negative means you're taking away something like television privileges or telephone privileges. So positive reinforcement is, pre is presenting something produces an increase in behavior. For example, bar pressing in a rat might lead to being fed. And that's the majority of what we do in the Skinner boxes. When they press a bar, they get fed. And so they increase their bar pressing. Or working for a human leads to being paid. The negative reinforcement is taking something away produces an increase in behavior. For example, responding might cause a high-pitched noise that exists to stop. So the bar pressing increases in order for the, for the noise to stop. Or a child will pick up their clothes in order to stop, again, a lot of noise, their parents from nagging them. Nag, 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 nag. All right, they pick up their clothes and you stop nagging. <laughs> That's negative reinforcement. The positive punishment, and I do not, I've told you this already, I do not adhere to the principles of punishment. Uh, it doesn't work, especially positive punishment. Negative punishment is better than positive punishment, but reward is always better than punishment. So presenting something reduces the occurrence of behavior. For example, if a rat moves off of a platform and we want it to stay on the platform, then they get shocked or dangerous driving leads to a big fine. And final example, and it doesn't work as well as, as negative punishment, and it has reasons for that we'll talk about, but a baby, you're holding a baby, the baby pinches you, so you slap the baby. It certainly will stop the pinching if they connect the fact that you're getting slapped for the pinch. And it also creates adrenaline flow, fear, anger, all kinds of negative consequences when you present that kind of punishment, a slapped or spanking a baby. 
negative punishment is taking something away. It works much better than positive punishment. It uh, doesn't work as fast, and that's why a lot of parents want to use positive punishment because it works almost immediately. But negative punishment works a little bit slower. It still works, and it produces a lot less of the negative consequences, the, the bad consequences. But reinforcement works way better to reinforce a different type of behavior instead of punishing the bad behavior. So negative punishment is taking something away, reduces the occurrence of behavior. For example, if we want a rat to stay out of the center of a box, then moving into the center of the box causes a pleasant brain stimulation to end. So they're all, they already have this brain stimulation going on. They feel really good. They're wandering around the cage. They go into the center of the box. The stimulation stops. They back out of that box, center of the box. They will walk all the way around the center, their perimeter of the box. They won't go back in the center of the box. Or a baby is being held. This is a much better way to handle this particular situation. Baby is being held. Baby pinches you. Put the baby down. Walk away. Because you assume that the baby wants to be held. And you're taking away that pleasant stimulation being held because they pinched you. Now you pick them back up a little bit later and they pinch you again, put them back down again. They will learn not to pinch you. And they won't have the negative consequences, the bad consequences. I kind of stopped using negative for meaning bad. The bad consequences of uh, related to the positive punishment, slapping or spanking. Now, negative punishment, it, there's an excellent example of negative punishment. If you are a parent and you have your child's love and respect, not fear, love and respect, and they do something that you don't want them to do, you say, you really disappointed me. I'm so disappointed. Oh, that will kill them. <laughs> Just that. And that's negative punishment. Your respect of them, your, your um, love for them, oh, you disappointed me. They want that. You can't develop that when they're teenagers. You have to develop that in their first four years of life. You have to make that connection to them. So that's another negative punishment type of thing. You, oh my gosh. I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> that hurts. They will do anything. Get back into your good graces. So the punisher's power usually disappears when the threat of punishment is removed. Uh, I have 10 cats. I've already told you that. And I don't want them on the kitchen counter. So I have a spray bottle of water. And when they get up on the kitchen counter, I spray them with water. I squirt them. And they hate that. So they jump back down off the counter. And I don't see them. I mean, even the young, the young kittens that are one year old now, they don't get up on the counter when I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> I haven't taught them to stay off the counter. I've taught them to stay off the counter when dad's around. <laughs> so we're not, and I know they get up on the counter because I'll be coming down the steps into the kitchen and I hear a clunk as they jump off the counter. <laughs> Or I see their little paw prints on the counter, so I know they've been up there, and I can't punish them after the fact. It has to be an immediate punishment. So I can also take, uh, this is the best way to do this if you guys have cats. Cats hate tin foil for some reason, so put tin foil all over the countertop. You are not in the room. Nobody's in the room. They jump from the floor onto the tin foil. Ah, they freak out and jump off, and they won't to take a few times, they won't get back up on that countertop again because they can't see the countertop to see if the tinfoil is up there or not. Unless they can get up on the kitchen table and look to see if it is and then jump off the counter. So there's all kinds of contingencies here. Okay? Positive punishment often triggers aggression. You, you spank in your child for doing something wrong. You slap your child for doing something wrong. When somebody does something wrong to them, they're going to punch them. They go to school and somebody takes their favorite toy. 
bang, because that's what you've taught, you've taught them that if somebody does something bad, they get punished by aggressive behavior. And you have taught that to your child. Punishment may inhibit new learning and better responses as well, because once you've slapped or spanked the child, then they're crying, they have the adrenaline flowing, they're not thinking straight at that point, and you can't punish them and then take them and say, this is what you're supposed to do, and take them over to where they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to do, and, and tell them how they're supposed to do it. They're not listening, they can't listen, they're full of adrenaline and anger management at that point. So they're crying, they're, there's, they're in no shape to learn anything at that point. Punishment is often applied unequally. You, you punish a child one way at one time for doing one thing, you punish it a different way another time for doing it. And also if they have siblings, you punish one sibling differently than you punish the other sibling. And for one thing a sibling does, it's okay for them, but not okay for the other one. So it's not equal in, in the way that is given. And when punishment does seem to work, it works is when it's immediate and when it's consistent. So applied equally, consistent, and immediate. It's not a good idea, which a lot of uh, parents do, wait till your daddy gets home. <laughs> no, that doesn't work anywhere near as well as if you did it yourself. But uh, your, I, <laughs> My mom was my vice principal of one of my elementary schools. <laughs> I never got sent to the principal's office. I got sent to the vice principal's office. And I got in trouble immediately for going to the vice principal's office because that was my mom. Then I went home and I got in trouble again because I embarrassed her at school. And then when dad came home, I got in trouble again for the same thing that I already gotten punished for because dad was upset that I had done something wrong and embarrassed mom. So does that help? No, it didn't help. It did not help. <laughs> and... Uh, it's very hard to be immediate and consistent because you don't see all the bad things they do. Uh, they get away with some of them and not all of them. So it's better to reward good behavior than to punish bad behavior. And yes, it takes longer for the behavior to change if you're trying to change behavior that way. If you find a behavior that a child does inappropriate, then find the appropriate behavior and pay attention to that, give reward for that appropriate behavior. For instance, <laughs> siblings tend to fight. But if you have children and they're always fighting in the house, and then one day you meet somebody that knows them and, and cares for them outside the home, you know, your children are just marvelous, wonderful, you know, angels. Like, who are you talking about? <laughs> Not my children. My children are always fighting. Why? You are rewarding bad behavior. Because as soon as they start fighting, they get attention from you, and that's what they want. They want attention from you. So you have created a situation where the children fight in the house because that's when you pay attention to them. If they're quiet in the house and just behaving, it's like, oh, be quiet. Oh, please let the status quo continue. I don't want any more noise in the house. I don't want all this uh, disturbance in the house. So you just sort of leave them alone. No, 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 no. When they're behaving, that's when you need to hug them and love on them and tell them how good they are and interrupt them. It's fine. They want the attention. They want the attention, and when the way to extinguish that type of behavior is, as long as they're not causing blood to flow, let them fight and ignore them. You have been giving them the reward. Take the reward away, and that behavior will slowly extinguish. Even if your behavior toward them is uh, harsh, it's still behavior that they want because it's attention in some kind, way, shape, or form. So the alternatives to punishment, extinction, as I just said, some bad behaviors have been rewarded, so you need to stop the reinforcement. You need to find out what it is that's reinforcing that behavior, and the response will decrease with no reinforcement following it. Or 
reinforce preferred activities, give rewards to the behavior that's the opposite of what they're doing. Whatever behavior they're doing, and the dog is the same way. I, I had a dog that used to just bark like crazy when the phone rang and I was talking on the phone. They, they freaked out when I was talking on the phone. So I didn't yell and holler and scream at the dog. I had the dog come over to sit next to me and I fed it treats and petted it while I was talking on the phone. And eventually it stopped barking at the uh, phone ringing and barking while I was talking on the phone. It would come and it would sit down next to me and I would pet it. Didn't have to give it rewards anymore. I just, the pet is a reward as well. So increasing activities you like by reinforcing them and thus decreasing the behavior that you don't want. Competing behaviors cannot exist together. So find the competing behavior and reward the competing behavior. There is a problem of circular logic in operant conditioning because we say we're giving a reward, but we have no idea if we're giving a reward until we see the actual behavior change. So what is a reinforcer? It's something that increases behavior. What, why did the behavior increase? Because it was given a reinforcer. But wait, you, you couldn't define the reinforcer until after the behavior was actually there. Sort of like you want to know what an automobile is. So you look up automobile in the dictionary because it's the A's, so it's the first one you're going to come to. It says C car. Oh, great. So then you go to the C's and you look up a car and the car says C automobile. <laughs> it didn't give you what you needed to know, right? So this is circular logic. They're already defining something before they know what it is that it's going to do. There are six ways that we can compare classical conditioning and operant conditioning. The first one in operant conditioning, the reinforcer or punishment must follow the behavior you wish to strengthen. Of course, in classical conditioning, there is no reinforcer or punisher. The neutral stimulus must precede the unconditioned stimulus. In operant, uh, in operant behavior, the reward can be delivered on either a continuous or intermittent schedule. There is no such thing as an intermittent schedule in classical conditioning, the neutral stimulus is almost always continuously paired with the unconditioned stimulus. The extinction phase will occur in operant conditioning and it, the extinction phase will also occur in classical conditioning. They both have an extinction parameter. And in operant conditioning, the partial reinforcement produces stronger behavior patterns that extinguish slower. But in classical conditioning, you can't use partial. Partial pairing of a neutral stimulus and unconditioned produces a weaker behavior that extinguishes faster. And the other, another way, the goal of operant conditioning is to change the rate of a particular behavior, voluntary behavior. Classical conditioning, the goal is to connect a response, a reflex action, to a neutral stimulus. And the last one, uh, all operant conditioning is all about voluntary responses. Classical is all about involuntary reflex actions. And that's classical and operant conditioning compared together. Are there any questions about operant or classical conditioning before I continue? I'm seeing a lot of no's. Good. Remember, when I ask a no, yes or no question, Responding yes or no shows that you're still here and that I can count you as present. So continue to respond when I ask those questions. So behaviorists do not consider thinking. We don't say the animal thinks about what it wants to do and then does it because it thought about it. It just does it because neurons that fire together wire together. So we have created a pathway of behavior in the brain using rewards and punishments. We don't say we think about it or that animals think about it. But according to cognitive psychologists who believe in thinking, then some forms of learning has to be explained as changes in mental processing rather than as changes in behavior alone. For instance, insight learning, where you are working on something really hard and you can't get it. It just will not come to you. So you finally give up and you go to bed and at 2 o'clock in the morning, you wake up and you've got the answer in your head. 
So you've been thinking about it. It's tr there's no way other than to say you just found the pathway that existed already. No, you created a pathway to that particular uh, information that you needed. So that's insight learning. Cognitive maps are kind of interesting that show that we do think in specific ways. I'm going to draw you something here. Hold on. Let me get annotation. Go to drawing. All right. Let's see if you recognize what I'm drawing here, because I'm not a very good drawer, but uh, let's see if you can figure it out. What did I draw? A uh, ship. Correct, Lauren. Yes. A uh, ship. A boat. So you have now seen my boat. And you now know that I drew a boat. And you also know that hopefully this right here is actually an anchor. Right? An anchor. Now, next time we get together, I'll say to you, uh, remember that boat I drew did it have an anchor? I guarantee that you will say yes, it had an anchor before anyone in Israel who uses Hebrew as their first language will say yes. You will be faster to say yes than anybody in Israel who uses Hebrew as their, as their language, as their first language. If I ask them in Hebrew, did it have a an anchor, they will say yes slower than you will. It's a fraction of a, you know, of a second, but they will be slower than you. Can you figure out why? And this is all about cognitive maps. How we think. Nobody has a clue. How about if I told you, if I switch the direction of the boat, they will answer faster than you. They will come up with the answer, yes, it has a, an anchor faster than anyone who uses English as a, their major language. That is correct. Yes, Catherine has got it. Not only do they read Hebrew right to left, and we read English left to right, so they're exact opposites of each other, but that causes us to see the world right to left or left to right. And if that particular um, picture that I drew was looking, being looked at by someone who uses English, they're looking at, they see the anchor almost immediately. But a person who uses Hebrew would go through the boat until they came to the end, and then they would see it. And of course, it takes a fraction of a second difference, but it will be a big difference. And if I switch the direction of the boat, they see from right to left, they will see the anchor first. That shows that we think, and, uh, the way, and our language see, causes us to see the world in different ways. Very good. Very good, Catherine. So that's a mental representation of physical space. And we can do this anyway when we think about where we left our car keys, uh, where we left our purse or our wallet, or um, we are, where we're going. We can see where we're going in our heads. We know where it is that we're headed to, and we can find the best way to get there, the fastest way to get there, or as my wife likes, the back roads to get there because she doesn't like to go on the main roads. So she finds the back roads to get there. It might take longer, but she feels safer because they're not, nobody's traveling at 77 miles an hour past her. So she prefers the back roads. Social learning is another way to look at how we learn by thinking. And this was done by Bandora. It's a form of cognitive learning in which new responses are required by watching other people behave and the consequences of their behavior. Unfortunately, it works against us also because if we watch a person steal $5 million and get put in jail, but nobody ever finds the money, <laughs> and then they're in jail for four years and then they get out and they're living in a 
country without extradition with the $5 million that they stole, then we're going to look at them and go, I can put, I can go to jail for four years and live off in Costa Rica for off of $4 million. That'd be terrific. So it doesn't always work as well as um, always looking for the best thing. It doesn't always give us the best responses, but this is called observational learning, watching other people. And the best experiment to show this was the Bobo doll experiment performed by Albert Bandora. Albert Bandora, in his day, Bobo was just as well known as Ronald McDonald is today. If I say Ronald McDonald, every one of you pictures Ronald McDonald knows exactly who it is I'm talking about. In his day, when he did this experiment, Bobo the Clown was that famous. And Bobo had some, some toys. You could get this stuffed toy of Bobo the doll, and it, the bottom of the was rounded and was very heavy, like metal, so you could push the Bobo doll and it would always stand up straight. It never laid over unless you were laying on top of it, holding it down. So that was Bobo doll, and I actually had a Bobo doll once, uh, not the really, really big ones, but a small one. And as this particular experiment, what they did was they put children in a room with a whole bunch of toys and watched them play with the toys and recorded all of the things that they were doing playing with the different toys. Bobo the Clown was one of the toys that was in the room. Then they took the children out of the room and they put them in a room where they could watch adults go into the room and play with the toys. The adults were given very specific behaviors to do. Pick up specific toys and beat the stuffing out of the Bobo doll. And so they did. Now this was not behavior we saw in any child that was originally in the room. Never saw them do this. When the children were placed back in the room, they picked up toys and they beat the stuffing out of the Bobo doll. <laughs> so be aware, your children are watching you. Children learn from our behaviors and learn from what we say. They learn to say the same things we say because in another example of that particular experiment, they put the, the adults into the room while the children were watching and they had the adult, adults play normally with, regular, with the toys regularly and then one adult was allowed, told to pick up a toy eventually and beat the stuffing out of the Bobo doll. And the other adults would, were to tell them very specific words, no, don't do that, that's bad behavior. And so they put the children back in there, and eventually one of the children would pick up a toy and beat the stuffing out of the Bobo doll, and the other children would say, no, don't do that, that's bad behavior. So they learn what we say, they learn what we do, and that is social learning. It doesn't have to happen to you, you can just watch it happen, and you learn to behave that way, or not to behave that way. Social learning can also take the form of token economies, and it turns out that there was an excellent experiment uh, with octopi. You all know what an octopus is, right? It's a, it's a type of marine animal with eight legs. Okay, I'm seeing lots of yeses. Good. All right. So in, a, in the United States, when you do research with animals, you have very specific uh, things that you have to do with those animals. You're not allowed to do specific things with it. You are, their rules protect the animals. But human beings in a, you have, your subjects are even higher level of rules. You cannot do certain things you could do with animals, with humans, right? In Europe, the octopus, if it is in an experiment, has the same level of respect and control as humans. It is that smart an animal in the ocean. It might be the smartest animal in the ocean. And here's the experiment they did. They put two aquariums next to each other with octopuses in the aquarium. One octopus in one, one octopus in the other. In one of the octopuses, the one on the right hand side, they took a glass jar and they put the favorite food of that particular octopus in the jar and they closed it up. It was a screw on top. They put water in the jar so the jar wouldn't float. The jar fell to the bottom. 
of the aquarium and the octopus jumped on its favorite food, but it couldn't get to it because it can't get through the invisible barrier, glass, right? So it's trying to get to this. It has eight legs. It's holding the glass. It's trying to get to it and eventually recognizes that the top of it, the metal part of it, moves. And so it starts playing with the metal part and eventually it learns over many trials to open up the glass jar. It unscrews the top. And you let that octopus continuously do that. After a while, it just jumps on the, unscrews the top, gets its food. Jumps on it, unscrews the top, gets its food. The other octopus in the left-hand aquarium watches this. It's watching what the other octopus is doing. And you eventually get its favorite food, put it in a glass jar, screw on the top, put it in the glass in the, into its aquarium, and it pounces on it and unscrews the top. It didn't have any behavior that it knew how to do that. It didn't get rewarded for it at any time, but it watched the other octopus unscrew a top, and it learned how to unscrew a top. Yes, Sander, they are smart cookies. Yes, they are. Uh, and so this shows us even animals learn by social learning. Right? Of course, the octopus is one of the smartest of all the animals uh, in the sea. I'm sure that uh, of, the, of the fish variety, we have mammals in there also. The mammals are obviously smart too, but of the fishes, they're pretty, they're highly intelligent animals. So the brain mechanisms associated with this learning, the neurons obviously are part of this process. How the neurons um, work, we're not really sure yet, but we do know that there is the rule that states that as neurons fire together, they wire together. And we also know that when a, a neuron is fired off, it is easier for it to fire off a second time. And it, is, it fires off a stronger signal as it continuously gets fired off. So the biological process involving physical changes that strengthen the synapses in groups of nerve cells believed to be the neural basis of learning is long-term potentiation. The brain does change its networking connections when behaviors are performed often. In the hippocampus, we also have neurons that are being made and created, 700 a day, and they form and make new connections throughout your lifetime. And if a pathway is activated regularly, it builds more dendrites so that it can be easier to access and connections to help its activation, which also seems to increase its level of activation. So it increases its level of activation by increasing the number of axons it has as well. And this is known as long-term potentiation. Uh, biological factors that are involved in learning are innate. They're born into us. We have a tendency or predispositions which either impede or facilitate certain kinds of learning. We've talked about the phonological loop and how it can help and also impair our memories. And when they facilitate, they are preparing the organism to learn. This is called the preparedness hypothesis, that we are organisms that are designed to learn. Ethologists who use naturalistic observation to study animals discovered imprinting, we've talked about, which is an innate tendency for all animals of a specific species to respond in a specific way to some environmental cue. And ducklings follow the first moving creature they see. But also we notice that there are other animals that do specific tasks and they all do them at the same time. So it is not something that was learned, it's something that was built into the system like imprinting is. Salmon swim upstream to get to where it is that they were hatched, which is just, it's amazingly remarkable what they do. Uh, animal, a salmon will hatch in a specific stream where they were, where the eggs were laid. They will live in that stream for one to two years, and then they will, they will fall, flow down the stream into the ocean. They will live in the ocean for about seven years. And then there's a trigger of some kind, and all of that particular group will turn around and head right back to shore again, and they find the exact stream that they were hatched in. 
and it's not location because we could take the water from one stream and divert it into the area of another stream and take that stream and divert it into the area of the of the stream where they were supposed to go to and they don't head to the location where it was they head to the water that's coming out and they will follow that diverted stream back to the location where they were hatched and when they're flowing downhill downstream to go to the ocean they go over waterfalls and they make it all the way to the to the to the ocean when they come back the waterfalls they went over they have to swim up talk about powerful swimmers they have to get up that waterfall and as they as the surface tension breaks as they pass through the water they leap into the air and come down onto the other side of the waterfall and <laughs> That's where the bears congregate, because as they come out of the water, the bears are grabbing them with their jaws and chewing on salmon. Of course, they don't have to do that. The bears can just go all the way upstream where they're finally going to lay their eggs because salmon have worn themselves out so bad that they all die. They don't have another generation. They don't, they are, they are creating the next generation. They don't have themselves another year to go, you know, and create another generation or seven years to go. They die at that point. So that's salmon swimming upstream. They all end up back in the same place at the same time. And the swallows of Capistrano. Capistrano is a mission in California. And there are swallows that live at the station, at the mission, and they're fairly famous little swallows. And they build their nests on the sides of the missions. And in the winter time, in the fall and winter, they go to Argentina. They fly all the way down to Argentina, and then they come back again in the spring. And every single one of them will return to the mission in Capistrano at a, within one week. They all return within one week. That's not a learned trait. That is something that's built into them. So it's not really a... Uh, learned learning trait, but it is behavior that every single one of their species performs. So this indicates a biological preparedness to do specific things or, and it shows that we have the ability to learn specific things, we're prepared to learn specific things. Not all creatures in print, but all of us are prepared to learn things. And these show us the difference between the critical and sensitive periods. Because if a duckling does not imprint within a specific time period, it will never imprint and it will die because it does not follow its mother who will protect it. It just wanders off and who will feed it or make sure that they, they find a way to get food. That's a critical period. It has to happen in that time frame. But for human beings, most of the things that we have are sensitive periods, like language. We learn language within the first four years of our life. We're really got, grabbing that language. But if we don't hear it in the first four years, we can still get it within the first 12 years. But if we don't get it in the first 12 years, then we'll never learn language. We will learn words. We'll learn Yes, and please, Jeannie is an excellent example of that. She did not learn language. She was abused so poorly, so much, that she was picked up at the age of 13, and she, would, and she never did. She's living in a home where she's cared for uh, by, the, by the government because she cannot function as a normal human being. But it is a sensitive period because she, does, she did learn words. She learned some pieces of language, but she never learned enough to be able to function the way I'm functioning right now, having a string of consciousness come out of my mouth and not even thinking about what it is that I'm saying and hoping that it makes sense. <laughs> so that is the sensitive and critical periods. And that's the end of the learning section. Are there any questions about learning before uh, I go on? Okay.
So we've talked about rewards and punishments, and so I'm going to give you a reward. I'm ending class early today. If you want to stay and talk to me, that's fine. I will be here for a little while afterwards. Uh, if you don't, then you can go on, and I will see you on Thursday. Have a very nice Wednesday, and I will see you Thursday, more, Thursday afternoon. Stay healthy. Bye.